Welcome to a Friday Reads, where I talk about what I read, what I'm reading, what I hope to get to next, and I have finally finished a big book. <laughs> finished two books since we last talked. Actually three. Three. I just don't have something in the stack, but it's a novella as well. So we're going to talk about the three things I finished. I am very early days in three things, and um, so I don't have too many thoughts, and maybe they'll stay on my TBR, maybe I'll switch it up. My mood is vastly fluctuating, so I don't really know where I'll be. But first, um, we'll discuss what I finished. So first one, I finished the anthology Never Whistle at Night. Um, this really does have some absolutely stellar short stories in it. I do think like a lot of anthologies at around the 300 page mark, I start to like lose steam a little bit. Um, it becomes a bit more of a chore, which doesn't really make sense. And it happens in all anthologies that are a little on the long side for me, where just like I lose momentum. And it's just like, I kind of want to be done reading this thing, even though, per usual, when they curate things like this, the best stories are usually at the front and at the end, and some of my favorite stories were at the end of this, so it was totally, like, fine powering through. Like, I think at the end of this we had some stellar things. So Tommy Orange has a story in this collection, and if you haven't read There There by this author, one of my favorite contemporary pieces of fiction, but he had a really good one called Capgras. Um, kind of about this author who's going on tour to France for one of his translated works and he has extreme imposter syndrome within his identity and then he also learns that his work was mistranslated and there's this like kind of body horror element. It's awesome. Um, and then another one that I really like, Darcy Little Badger's never missed for me in anything I've read. I've read I think three or four of her short stories now. Um, the Scientist Horror Story. Um, it kind of did what a story earlier in this collection did where the real story isn't the story you're initially told, it's like the thing at the end. And I didn't really like the original one. The one that was earlier in this collection was like the scariest story ever told. That one I didn't really like. But this one, I, I really enjoyed the kind of fake story. I thought that was fun, cute. It, it was a good time. But then the like actual horror was, I thought, quite well portrayed. So that was like one of the second to last stories. Third to last collections was chilling. <laughs> That was about this indigenous woman at a college who's going to one of these like professor parties, which like I'm not in humanities. So I, as a scientist in college, I have never been invited to a professor's like house or home office for like a weird party. And I, I don't know, that just always feels weird to me. But regardless, I think this happens more in humanities spaces. And she goes and this woman has a collection of actual human heads on her walls and everyone takes it as very normal and, you know, it's, mm. The metaphor in there, the creep factor in there, the ending, so good. The only one of these last that I thought was a little weak, and I don't know if maybe I just should have read it physically, was the last one by the author who did Moon of the Crested Snow. It just, I felt a little too removed from it. Um, and it's interesting because I listened to Snow, uh, Moon of the Crested Snow, and I really liked that as an audiobook. So it's interesting that the short story that he put out didn't work for me as well in audio form. So there are a few in here that I might try and reread before I live show with my eyeballs to see if that changes the experience. But for the most part, I, I recommend. It's a good collection. Uh, I also finished Rose House by Arcady Martin. And uh, wow, this one kind of disappointed me a little bit, especially because it had a lot of promise and it did like, I okay, I'll just, just get into it and I'm gonna try really hard not to spoil anything. Um, but I do think there are things I think some people should know because at least this is a hard book to read for free, <laughs> at least in the United States. Um, if you want to read this for free, it's not in like any libraries. You can't get a physical copy. The ebook is like only available for purchase. So if you want to spend $6 on it, I feel like it's kind of important to know a little about it. It's a little harder to just go explore into it. That said, I'm not going to try and be spoiler free, but there are, it's a mystery and how the mystery pays off is I think important for determining if you want to pick this up. Okay. Because I was expecting a mystery and a mystery payoff similar to what we got in Texcalon, okay? Texcalon, the first book, is a political mystery. It's a political whodunit of like, who killed this ambassador before you and why? And you get really satisfying answers and payoff by the end of that story. It's really confusing, but this, there, I feel there was satisfying payoff for that. Here, it's a very different story, very different project. We are in a future world. And there is this house, Rose House, that is a complete AI construct. And the owner died and let one person have access to it for one week of the year. And then we have this detective who lives in the town where this building is. And suddenly there is a person dead in that house who is not the person allowed in the house and not the owner. So there's this murder mystery. And it's playing with genres. It's very meta playing with genres. We have multiple point of views. I think all of them are written really well. There's a lot of fun intrigue. 
it, but it's playing with a lot of genres, just noir, haunted house, like there's some literary vibes, especially with conversation and themes of architecture and art. And the, if you like the themes around places and how we interact with spaces and places and architecture, this might get on a little bit better for you. I'm not that tied to that theme. So that was all what, right over my head. And then the ending is, it's not a good resolution or it, it's not a resolution at all, really. And I looked through Goodreads just to make sure I wasn't missing something. And a large number of people also who had similar like experiences to me felt like the ending was very lackluster, not very satisfying for the mysteries that are put forth. So there's just, it's just very confusing. It's very short. Um, I do think of my weird reads of the month. I preferred Elysium from last week. I mean, they both have similar problems in terms of like, they are very unique narrative structures and you're very confused, but, and, but they're short. So you're like in and out. This one, my issue was I didn't feel like I got satisfaction that I wanted. And yeah, and both of those books are kind of hard to get for free in the United States. They're not all held by libraries and things like this. I don't even think this one has an audiobook. I kind of did look. So yeah, that was kind of a bummer. Like I didn't hate it, but I, it had so much promise when I was reading it at the beginning. It was like, oh, this is so interesting. What is happening? I was, I was liking the writing style, but because it's a novella, I couldn't even let go of the plot payoff or lack thereof by being attached to these characters because there's not even really character arc payoff. So, and then I didn't connect to the themes. So I was left very whelmed, very whelmed to underwhelmed, you know, with this one. And then the last thing I finished was my chonker of Boy of Kings. <laughs> um, I didn't actually read from this copy. I've read from this copy like three times. This is actually a first edition <laughs> without its dust jacket. I have no idea where the dust jacket is. I, when I first got this book in 2010, did not like that cover art and I just got rid of them. And I don't think I regret that decision because if I could just have the dust jackets without all the blurbs, maybe that would be pretty, but they're like covered in blurbs and synopses that don't make sense. So they're not even like fun art for me. So if I ever want those covers, I'll just maybe buy the floppy paperbacks, but I doubt I'll ever do that. So regardless, I finished it and it was so good. Like, and I think I learned something about like myself as a reader right now, um, where I'm not a visual reader. It's really hard for my imagination to make clear, crisp pictures. Um, it does make something. I just, it would be hard for me to verbalize for you. It's more of a feeling. It is immersive. It's just not visual. Um, and in this one, when I was especially getting to like the climax at the end, there are some scenes that felt more put together than I was used to. And it's happening actually in another book I'm talking, I'll be talking about. So I think my imagination has developed in a way that it's doing more than it used to. And that's kind of a fun situation. Now, granted, it's been happening in rereads. And I do think that's a thing that can happen with a reread experience is you can take more out because you're familiar. So you're not just processing new material, you're reprocessing it again. And then also you can add other layers onto it. Uh, but I really liked it. And yeah, I, I have no notes of it. It was, it was really good. I, I could appreciate why we were getting the information we were. I could see why certain chapters were put near each other. There's so much funness with what you know later on, like the rereadability of like, oh, I'm looking at this through a new lens now because I know things. So cool. And it's just like, gosh, it's such a ballsy setup book. It's so ballsy, barely anything happens. It does have a really good climax for one of our character arcs. And, but it's like truly just a setup for two of our main characters. Actually three, arguably, it, like all of them are just getting put into their positions. Um, but one of them does have a very satisfying arc within it. And like all of them have arcs. Like, it's just, I just think it's really ballsy, especially because like when I think about the first leg of this series, most of the big payoff is in the second book, but you had to wait like four to five years between them, I think, right? This came out in 2010, maybe only three years, but still a thousand days to wait between the reveal of the way of Kings <laughs> towards a radiance. I, gosh, that reveal was something special. I'm still waiting to see how I feel about the payoff of all these reveals. <laughs> we'll see how wins and truth pays off with that. Um, so I think in a couple weeks, we'll have this discussion. I don't remember whose channel it's on. It's either Jesse's or Stephanie's, I think. Regardless, for jo um, Roger's Cosmic Read Along, we will be discussing that. And I'm just really happy that I did a slow reread. It was very fun. I enjoyed my time. And yeah, okay. Oh, my last note is, I, I st seriously do not understand how Kramer and Redding cannot just like once in a while with all these fantasy names, just come together and say, we're gonna say the name this way, right? Like just, it's, it's, just, it's, it's Sadeus or Sadius, pick one. Pick one. I don't really care, but it's so charming. And they like, don't they live together? I don't know. It just, it just, even if they don't live together, it just feels like as a professional team, 
of audio booking, when you got weird names, you just decide, okay, let's just say it this way, and you move on. It doesn't seem like a hard meeting to have, but you know, what do I know? I don't know. I don't narrate audiobooks. Okay, um, the only other things that I have to discuss about starting is I started The 100,000 Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. I haven't read this since 2019, so I'm like really excited. And I'm only reading this because my friend Laura at a book circus wanted to read it. I'm like, oh, if you want, we can buddy read it. And actually, I think last year was the only year we didn't have a February buddy read. We typically have February buddy reads, and they typically are books I really love. Like we did The Prey of Gods one year, we did The Banished Birds. We tend to have really good taste. So I was really excited to have a chance to reread this. And I'm listening to the audiobook this time, which is not Robin Miles, which was a bit sad, but I actually do like this narrator, so it's fine. <laughs> Um, and it, I would caution people to just go into this as an audiobook because it's one of those classic weird narrative frameworks that Jemison likes to play with. And it's you have visual cues when you're reading it that, oh, she's going into an aside. But in the audio, there are pauses and stuff, but you might be like, wait, why did this sentence get just like chopped here? And so I personally, I think the visual cues might be more helpful. But that said, I really like the accents the audio narrator's using. I think Jemison's prose works really well in an auditory storytelling format. I think it works both ways. Um, so yeah, but I'm listening to it this time and, and physically reading it because, you know, I just, I just love Jemison. And it's just so fun. I'm just, and it's also one of those rereads where scenes, I, I can actually see this, this kingdom in my head a little bit better. It's like a truly spectacular piece of architecture. And this world is so full of magic and larger than life situations. So I'm really enjoying the new visual effects. It's got some horror vibes. It's got all this political intrigue and you're, the main character is so confused. So you are just as confused as her and I really like that combination. But on reread, I know the answers. And so it's really fun kind of like there are lines that these other gods say around her that I'm like I know what that means now and it's really exciting and I really enjoy it. Um, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea um, especially because this is a story and um, it's always hard to describe <laughs> the inheritance trilogy to people because it's like each book's an individual thought but it is kind of chronicling hundreds of years in this world where mortals and immortals intersect but these immortals are truly immortal gods much similar to immortal gods in Greek pantheon um, Hindu mythology, like basically it's just, it's pulling from a bunch of religions where you have these larger than life mythological immortal creatures and they don't act like humans, <laughs> which leads for some very interesting scenarios. Some of them more uncomfortable than others. And I just, yeah, especially like there is a God child who is literally one of the oldest beings on the, in the cosmos. He's like one of the first gods that was born from the original gods or whatever. And so he's a child, he embodies childlike wonder but also he is a very old individual. So sometimes that dichotomy is a little weird, especially with situations he's put in because these gods are also enslaved by this empire when you start off this book. And yeah, it's interesting. I really like it. And I also just love Jemison prose. Like I can, I can just read books by her all the time. So it's also just nice coming back to it because I haven't read her in a minute. So that's really fun, early days there. I haven't continued on with Jinbot, but I'm kind of planning to now that I have some space in my reading, maybe, I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> the problem is, is I don't have an audiobook for this, which also leads me to the other book that I picked up that I don't have an audiobook for, which is also a sci-fi, and that is The Imposition of Unnecessary Obstacles. And I'm so bummed because I thought there would be an audiobook. We had one for the first novella, and like we have one for all of her books in the Infomocracy trilogy, so I don't know why this one doesn't have an audiobook, but it bums me out because Malka Earl Older works infinitely better for me <laughs> with audiobooks. And I really liked the narrator for the first one in the series. I'm trying to read this one. I was trying it as like my before bed book and I just kept falling asleep. And like her sentence structure in my brain, it just, I need to be a little more awake. <laughs> like right now, Paiti is like thinking in a lecture and I'm like, I don't, what are you doing? What, what are these run on sentences? I can't, I can't figure you out right now. <laughs> so I want to give it a few more chapters because I really love the prologue because we were with, um, the detective character. Her name starts with an M, but I am blanking on it right now. And I really like her perspective, but I know from the first book, we don't normally get her perspective. We normally get like a prologue with her perspective and then we're with the other character in first person, which is fine. I just, I really like the other character's perspective. So we'll see, I wanna power through that, but the problem is that one and this one don't have audiobooks, So I am left to physically read with my eyeballs and that time is quickly diminishing. And I don't always have like a wake brain. <laughs> like, I come home from teaching and my brain is just like, ah, 
that or I need to like use that brain to like right now I need to read up on the muscles of the body it's like you know so I kind of and I have to read up on the Krebs cycle and like things like that like there's things I gotta read <laughs> and use my brain for so those are kind of on my list mental health's been doing mental health things and I've been trying really hard not to buy an ebook but I'm like I bride is still not available six weeks six weeks I do think I've realized I'm not going to read House of Shadow and Flame for a very long time, maybe ever. I don't know, because I was given the opportunity to like jump the line. You know how like if you're a little bit, you can jump the line. And I just, I was like, nah, because <laughs> I was reading Way of Kings. And it's like, I don't have time for another 800 page book. I don't have that right now. And I don't really care what happens. So who knows if I'll get to that. But I still want to read Bride. I really do. Um, Especially because, like, I think I need a compulsible, like, easy read right now. I feel like a lot of, like, Jemison's not hard. It's a reread. I really enjoy the prose, but it's not, like, a candy read. And then my two sci-fis, um, I really do like Semet Bousset's voice. Or Semet Basu. Semet Basu. I love this voice, but it definitely still takes a little more brain. And then Malka Older's writing style always just takes, like, so much of my brain. I don't know why, how she conveys thoughts in my brain don't coexist well. And I want to because her world is so cool. Like we're learning about parts of the world right now at the beginning of this novella. It's so cool how they live on Jupiter, like on Jupiter. That's a gaseous planet, guys. Like that's wild. Like the thought process behind that is such fun science fiction. I just need to find some brain cells and some time. So that's, that's this one. Um, I don't think I have other thoughts or things to share. I can't even remember if I watched any new interesting movies. I don't think so. I saw the tail end of Jack Reacher because my grandma was in town and she wanted to watch it because she loves those books. I have not read those books. I have not read, watched the show, but that actor was Aquaman in the CW show Smallville. <laughs> that was my big takeaway. <laughs> um, if you want to just leave an emoji to let me know you're here, leave a castle or a kingdom or a crown for the 100,000 kingdoms because I'm so pumped to be reading that. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.